Hello YouTube. You'll often hear people say that bodybuilding is gay, which is something I've always found particularly stupid. And since Andrew Tate has gotten in trouble recently for some of the things he said about bodybuilding, including that it is gay, I decided to make a combo video. I'm going to take this opportunity to both debunk the idea that bodybuilding is for gay men, while also finally wading in on the Andrew Tate situation. If you are on this channel, you're most likely acquainted with my ability to break down people on a psychological level. I've done so in the past, and I know that you guys enjoy it tremendously. So this is going to be a chance for me to do the exact same thing to Andrew Tate, because while I believe the guy to not be super interesting, he represents a trend on YouTube, but also on the internet in general, that I find extremely concerning. So I think it is of public interest that I actually spend some time and destroy the guy and what he stands for. This video is going to be extremely long in my usual style, and because I want to be complete and I want everything to be structured properly, I'm going to be taking my time. Everything is going to be time-stamped, but for now, we're just going to sit back and go through the arguments I prepared. The first portion of the video is going to be concerning the gay attribute or nature of bodybuilding. I'm going to run through the arguments that people who say that try to present to make their claims and, their, and to make a case for their statement. And then in the second part of the video, I'm going to focus exclusively on Andrew Tate, the psychology of the character, what he stands for, etc, etc. I recommend you watch the entire video because the two parts are connected, but if you want to skip ahead, it is absolutely your right. So let's get started right away. First and foremost, the type of bodybuilding that Andrew Tate uh, points out when he says that it is gay is pro-bodybuilding because in his examples, he talks about men on stage, men comparing their muscles with one another. That is a very small niche of bodybuilding. It's not even 0.1% of it. I personally bodybuild. I never went on stage. I never got old up and I never compared my glutes with another man. So that's already very important to establish because most of the time when people mock or point at bodybuilding, what they talk about is pro bodybuilding, which is not the same thing. Bodybuilding is the pursuit of aesthetics. It's lifting for looks. The majority of people who train, train for looks. And therefore, the majority of people are bodybuilders. You do not need to compete to be a bodybuilder. It's in the name. Bodybuilding. If you build your body, guess what? Body, you are a bodybuilder. So that's the first thing. But uh, I believe that Tate did that on purpose. I think he conflated the two on purpose because that way he annoys the maximum of people possible. I think that when this guy speaks, he doesn't think about logic or if he's going to make sense. He thinks about messing with as many people as possible so as to get attention. And therefore, of course, lumping everyone in the same bodybuilding bag is the best way to do so. Now, he also opens, and this is his main argument, by stating that bodybuilding, so again, the conflation of the terms, bodybuilding is a beauty pageant. Anyone who does bodybuilding, who trains for looks, has heard that before. It's a beauty pageant, and in reality, it's a comparison made with women, and you're being told, well, you do exactly what women do on stage. It's just a competition to see who's prettiest. First and foremost, uh, the two have nothing to do with one another, because Beauty patients for women tend to focus on the face and bodybuilding, of course, focuses on the body. You can be an ugly motherfucker and win at bodybuilding. Just look at Ronnie Coleman. The guy looks like a black, a black frog and yet he won Mr. Olympia too many times to cite. So that's already stupidity and something that clearly comes from someone who does not know what bodybuilding actually is. But I want to go back on the female thing because I believe that when men make fun of bodybuilding by comparing it with beauty patients, what they really try and attempt to do is they try to compare you with a girl. They're essentially saying, ha, ah, you do what women do and therefore it's bad. It's like growing up when someone told you, you hit like a girl, you run like a girl. These were scarcely compliments. These were made in a fashion so that has to hurt your feelings because as a man, of course, if you are akin to a girl, it is a bad thing. We're going to see that it also connects with the gay thing because 
in Andrew Tate's mind, and it mo most of the people who use these arguments' mind, gay equals, equals female. So when they call you gay, they call you girly, and if they call you girly, they, they call you gay. The two are interchangeable and rowdy. This also shows the lack of nuance that these people are capable of, but it's interesting that I pointed out because this is already the bulk of the argument, right? Bodybuilding is gay because it is something that girls also do, therefore it is bad. This is the logic at hand here. Um, we're going to get back to that, but if you are my age or older, that should already peeve you out a bit because when you're 12 years old and you point out someone that does something that you don't like and you call them gay, that's acceptable because you're young and stupid. But the guy is in his 30s, uh, I didn't even really check to see, but I know he's older than I am. And yet he still uses that level of arguments that is extremely concerning, especially since people repeat said arguments and think that they actually come with logic. There is absolutely no logic in this statement at all. I also want to, again, make the connection with beauty pageants and the fact that caring about the way you look is not inherently feminine. I don't know where that comes from. Maybe it's because of makeup. Makeup is one branch of lookism. It's one branch of taking care of your appearance. But there are so many other things that you can do to look better. And none of them make you gay or make you feminine, or at least not, not the ones that I apply to my life and that most men apply to their life. And bodybuilding is one such case. Why would wanting your body to look better be gay? If you do that to impress girls, if you do that to feel better about yourself, how is that gay? It would be gay if you lifted to attract other men. But in this case, it's because you are sexually attracted to these other men, which then can be qualified as gay. That's pretty much where it starts and ends. And I think that this is also a dangerous speak because it puts in men's mind that the way to be masculine and to be anti-feminine in a sense is to just be a complete slob, to not take care of yourself, which is only going to men being less attractive and therefore having difficulties with women, which is going to build more resentment. We will see that this might very well be the point of Andrew Tate's statements and strategies, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I also want to point out something that is quite hypocritical because Andrew Tate states that bodybuilding is gay and in his mouth bodybuilding is caring for looks, but the guy also trains for looks. He also trains to look better. And I know that he doesn't, he says he doesn't, he says he doesn't lift weight, he just does calisthenics, but the calisthenics also make his body look better. And whether he claims it's for martial arts only, it really doesn't matter because it doesn't stop him from posting pictures of himself shirtless on Instagram. So what exactly is going on? Is it too hot? Is he overeating? Is it, is it why he's not wearing any clothes? I think that this is a total sign of someone who is saying a thing and doing a completely different thing. Bodybuilding is gay, trying to look better is gay, flaunting your looks is gay, but I'm going to post a thousand pictures of me shirtless on Instagram so that everyone can see how jacked I am. How do you reconcile the two? Is it a case of if I do it, it's fine, but if someone else does it, it's, it's gay? How does that make any sense? Well, I think it makes no sense at all. I think the guy is uh, just a textbook hypocrite and he indulges in vanity just as much as bodybuilders do. He enjoys lifting to look better just as, just as much as every single man does. Everyone who, who lifts to an extent or another wants to look better. It's the reason why 99% of people start lifting. Therefore, calling it gay is absolutely comical. And it's also comical coming from an influencer who clearly has a very talented image aimed at appearing as masculine as possible. Let's not kid ourselves. Influencers spend, I was going to say 80%, 100% of their time trying to perfect their image. They care more about what they look like than what they actually provide as, much, as far as content goes. The way you look on Instagram, for example, is everything. Fuck your message. Fuck what you stand for. What do you look like? This is most of these masculinity gurus, which Andrew Tate is a part of. All of these guys spend a lot of time and money crafting the perfect masculine image to sell to you so that you're going to buy their products. And this guy is the same. I checked his Instagram. It's always the same thing. It's him in a private plane. It's him with a cigar. It's him with a perfectly shaped beard with glasses who is next to like a, a very attractive girl. It's him fronting his money. How is that not vanity? How is that not quote unquote gay if we look at his own standards of what being gay is? So me lifting to look better is gay, but you shaping your beard like uh, an egomaniac in the mirror every single morning, that is not gay. That also doesn't compute. It is pure hypocrisy. 
and the entire Instagram sphere is full of hypocrites, of course. Um, but I also, and we'll get back to that, want to point out that the entirety of the masculinity sphere on this platform in particular hinges on showing you an image that you want to become yourself, which means that we are dealing with people who are very good at manipulation. Put that in your head, we're going to get back to that. The conclusion on that part, on the, on that part in particular is that it is incredible to call bodybuilding a beauty pageant when you partake in Instagram because Instagram is the biggest beauty pageant on earth. The good and the people who are attractive make it and the rest flounder and die. It is just the law of the system and Andrew Tate knows it because he participates in it. This is how he makes his living. And as someone who claims to reject modernity, Tate seems to ignore that the ancient Greeks put a lot of stock on physical beauty. Something else that points to him being either a hypocrite or an idiot who doesn't understand his own message. At this point, the reject modernity uh, uh, theme is a meme, it's everywhere in short. But I always love when I see the message, right? When I see the content of the people who call their videos that. Because it's always full of modern stuff. Reject, reject modernity, but you're going to show me PD users in your video? How is that not modernity? It is modernity 101. It's drug use, it's vanity, it's early death, it's nihilism. Andrew Tate is the exact same. What type of modernity does he want you to reject? The guy is modernity incarnate. He's everything that this system, this consumerist system has created, and he wants you to go back to a tradition of sorts. All of that is hogwash. He's just repeating that because he knows that it appeals to your sensibility. Because you think that modernity is your problem, but you don't keep, but you don't understand that you are modernity. You are a modern man. You are part of the problem. If we are to reject modernity, we have to reject you. It's a part of you you have to combat, not the environment around you. This video is not about modernity, but I want you to keep in mind that the concept of modernity itself is widely misunderstood. And someone like Tate is clearly not able to encapsulate it because he is not uh, the philosopher that some, pe some people make him, out, make him out to be. Now, to go back to the ancient Greeks, if we're going to continue on the discussion on philosophy, as I said, physical beauty was extremely important. And the proof of that is the fa very famous quote by Socrates that said that it was a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty and strength of which his body is capable. Notice he didn't just say strength, he also said beauty. Why? Because in ancient Greece, the time where men were real men, according to people who reject modernity, men had to be strong, but they also had to be beautiful. Beautiful and beauty was seen as a virtue, which is interesting because someone like Socrates, for example, was extremely ugly and therefore it also contradicted this entire idea that only the beautiful could be virtuous, which is another discussion altogether. Now, to this day, I believe that there is still some truth in that. Beauty, at least trying to be as beautiful as possible, is a form of virtue. Because as a man, if you want to be more beautiful, you have really two ways. You can fall for the modernity trap and the vanity trap, and you can do plastic surgery, you can do uh, morning routines or whatever nonsense Instagrammers are going to sell you, which is in reality just a way for you to consume more. Or you can go, go the righteous path, which is to reinforce your body, to strengthen your muscles, which ultimately will make you look better and therefore also more beautiful. That is the male beauty standards that we are supposed to follow, in my opinion. Therefore, this means that bodybuilding develops both the body and the mind. It is a complete practice that is going to lead you towards being a more complete man. And it's completely opposed to the social media way of doing the things I just explained, which is just empty consumerism that leads to vanity, but really doesn't really lead you anywhere else. In which case, we're also facing the harsh reality that Tate's words are completely empty as well. They mean nothing because the way of life he preaches is much more quote unquote feminine and vanity based than any type of bodybuilding pursuit you can actually follow. Which means one thing. It means that what Tate is doing is motivated by something deeper. He's not just saying that to say that. He's saying that because he has a goal in mind. And what is the goal? Well, I think that the goal is to appeal to people who are like-minded and who resent bodybuilding, who resent the pursuit of a more aesthetic body. 
But with him in particular, you can clearly see with the way he speaks that it's not just empty manipulation. He actually also thinks and feels it. Because to me, Andrew Tate copes when he says that. When he calls bodybuilding gay, he is trying to find reasons to explain why an activity that he dislikes or that makes him uncomfortable is the activity's fault and not his own. Allow me to explain. It is the equivalent of a man who sees a man shirtless and calls him gay for being shirtless in front of him. In this situation, please do tell me, who is the person with the gay thoughts? Is it the man who is shirtless or is it the man who cannot stand to see another man shirtless? I think that in this case, it is clear cut. The issue lays with the person who beholds, not with the item that is being behold. It is clear as day. And then we can look at two types of motivations. Is it maybe because the person who is beholding the item is gay? Or is it maybe because they resent the fact that the other man is shirtless, confident and looking good? The two are, in reality, as I said, options. I'm not going to sit there and explain to you that Andrew Tate is in reality closeted because I think that it's an insult to gay men everywhere. Not every gay dude who is in the closet becomes a bigoted asshole or an idiot like Andrew Tate. Some of them just punish themselves. But in this case, I think that the two are valid. And it really means something because when you take advice from someone, you want someone who is self-aware. If the person is not self-aware, they are very likely to lead you down a dark path because they themselves don't know what they are doing. Here, we might be dealing with someone who is insecure with their heterosexuality and therefore when they look at men on stage or men looking good, it makes them feel some type of way so they lash out and they call the practice gay. Likewise, it could also be in this case that he is someone that when he looks at someone else looking better than them, gets mad about it. And that also is, is due directly, directly to insecurity about his own looks. The issue is that there are a lot of young men who are like him. They're not too certain about their sexuality, which does not mean that they're gay. They just haven't affirmed their love for women yet. Or they also could look bad. They might be an aesthetic, an appealing to women. And someone like Andrew Tate is going to give them an out. Instead of having to face their issues and their problems and thinking, okay, I don't like myself. I'm not certain about where I stand. Let me do the work on the self and feel better. No, I'm going to project my insecurities. I'm going to say that the issue is outside of me. And I'm going to point out at these things that make me insecure that I should work on and say, no, these things are bad. Issue is, if the fix and the cure of your low self-esteem is to be found in bearing yourself via bodybuilding, but you call bodybuilding gay, what you just did is you put an X on the thing that would have led you out of the dark path and made you feel better. And now you will never attain it because you created a psychological barrier yourself that is going to make it so much more difficult for you to actually better yourself, which is extremely comical. Again, coming from someone who apparently tries to help men be the best versions of themselves. The only thing he's doing in reality here is that he is teaching you how to be a resentful little asshole which is something that he himself seems to be because you listen to him speak about bodybuilding, he is full of resentment. He is full of hidden feelings that he refuses to deal with, which is peculiar because the guy is an accomplished martial artist. And you could tell me, well, how does that make sense? The dude is a killer fighter. He has a very good record. That is not something that is deniable. So why does he resent bodybuilding so much? Well, I don't know. I'm not in his head, but... I can tell you as someone who did martial art and bodybuilding at the same time that every single time I came across a guy who gave me a tough time for being bigger than him, it was a dude who had very high levels of insecurity and who was not confident in himself. Likewise, I had like I had a teacher who was a small African guy, very scrawny, 5'4", 130 pounds. This dude was very small compared to me, but he was always cordial to me. Why? Because he knew that size had nothing to do in the practice of boxing and he would kick my ass. Therefore, he was very secure in his own masculinity. On the flip side, again, the guys that were not like this were insecure in their masculinity and they were trying to compensate for their low, their, their low level of confidence by attacking other men that were doing things that, again, made them uncomfortable. So most of the time, people who go after bodybuilders, who make fun of them, call them gay, etc., fall in that category. And it also shows that these dudes don't get it because they try to equate two things that have nothing to do with one another. And you see that in Tate's arguments as well. 
he is trying to match martial arts and the practice of bodybuilding, but the issue is that martial arts are sports and bodybuilding is an art. You can't compare the two. It is like attempting to compare a 100 meter dash with something like painting. It's not going to function. And I know that is something that is tough for some people to actually understand because you bodybuild with your body, but keep in mind that chess is a sport and you don't do sport, you don't do chess with your body, you do it with your brain. It's not limited by what is actually engaged in the activity is what I mean. What it's, it's limited by is the end result. Is it performance based or is it aesthetic based? If it's aesthetic based, most likely it is not really a sport. Now, this is all tangent, but I say that because if I am to offer an argument, I want it to be as sophisticated and nuanced as possible. But it also very well could be that in this case, Tate, in typical fashion, just said that bodybuilding is gay to be as controversial as possible because the internet, the internet fitness sphere is big and he knew he would upset people. It is his trademark. At this point, he just puts his shoes in his mouth because he knows it's going to get him traction, it's going to get him attention. Be very careful with that type of individual because they are like the contrarians of the internet they just make noise for the sake of making noise because at this point they have turned addicted to attention and are willing to do whatever to get attention, even if it means making clowns of themselves. You could then ask me why I am overanalyzing the statements of a clown. It's because this word is turning into clown wood and there are many people who align with that type of mentality. So I think it's important to go in and try to understand them on a psychological level so as to make sure that this type of attitude doesn't actually spread. But, as I said, I doubt it, because I think that uh, Tate's true feelings transpired in his homophobic rant, even though I don't really think it's homophobic. I just think that in his head, gay means stupid. He doesn't even relate it to the action of loving other men. And this says a lot, because in Tate's case, as I said, he was a very competitive kickboxer, and therefore you could think that he would be confident. But it could also very well be that, because he himself felt to be more aesthetic, He's taking out his insecurity on people who managed, and that actually makes sense. The guy is six feet three, and he is quite lanky. I think he's 190, which is fairly light for someone that height. I'm 20 pounds heavier than he is, which means that he, it could well be that for dealing with someone who tried his hand as, at bodybuilding, he tried to look bigger and better, but he could never break out of auto mode, and therefore he takes out his resentment out on the practice he could never actually be good at, by trying to ridicule it as much as possible. Ridicule is the weapon of two types of people. The mean, who like to hurt, and I fall into that category, and the idiots who like arguments. Making fun of something takes very little intelligence, and usually it only really takes the ability to again put your shoe in your mouth. And I say that because you have to understand that where there is resentment, there is no logic. That is, across the board, a factual statement. Every time someone is going to use ridicule to attack a practice or an idea, it is going to be based off of emotions alone. As I just demonstrated, calling bodybuilding gay is based on nothing logical. And yet, even with everything I just explained to you, I'm certain that some people in the comments are going to be like, well, the bodybuilding is still gay. Okay, it's because they think with their emotions, they don't think logically. And Andrew Tate is absolutely the type of guy to do the exact same thing, which I found extremely funny because one thing that he likes to repeat all the time and one of the reasons why he thinks that women are lesser than men is because he says that they are too emotional. Now, I agree with the idea women are emotional, but in my word, it is not something that makes them inferior. In his word, it does. And yet, if we just look at what I proved, he also is someone who is deeply emotional, especially in the way he argues. He relies entirely on that. And that is also, of course, by the fact that he's resentful. When you're resentful, resentment, resentment is an emotion. And so therefore, when you lash out, you're going to also use your emotions. But he, where it gets really interesting is that there is some genius in what Andrew Tate is doing because 
When you attack people based on emotions alone, they are very likely to respond with emotions alone as well. And it's something I noticed on YouTube Fitness in particular. I'm very late to the party as usual, but there are many of my colleagues on YouTube Fitness who responded to Andrew Tate and every single response was worse than the last. Why? They all argue, argued with their emotions because he managed to piss them off. Right now, you see me sitting right there. I'm sipping on my cup with some disgusting water. Do I look emotional to you? No, it's because he didn't actually get to me. But for the people who actually got hooked by his strategy, they were never able to just coldly deconstruct his argument because they fell for the meme, they fell for the emotion. And that's what Andrew Tate wants. He wants to create drama. And drama-based videos are always also based on emotions, which points out to him not being as intelligent as some people think. When I look at his followers, apparently he's beloved because he is above your average masculinity guru. But I think that is bullshit. When I listen to him speak, I don't see someone who is particularly intelligent. I see someone who is very good at taunting and provoking people and saying outrageous things. This takes absolutely no intelligence at all. I also would like to say that I am surprised that people managed to sit through this guy talking for that long. I had to watch his videos, the few that still remain on the internet to prepare for this video. It's an absolute torture. The guy says stupidity after stupidity. And it was my great displeasure to see that a lot of people apparently bow down to him as being supremely intelligent, something that he seems to believe as well. Uh, I personally don't believe that. I even saw someone call him a warrior philosopher. I don't know about the warrior part, but the philosopher part, I mean, if this guy is a philosopher, then I am the fucking Pope. Now that that is being said, we can move on with the rest of this argument. So this was for the emotion part and the fact that Tate ridicules bodybuilding, which means he has no argument. And again, we could find this very weird because Tate himself takes pride in his body. Why would he make fun of bodybuilding and trying to look better when he put, posts shirtless pictures of himself and he clearly enjoys looking better? But in his case, the uh, argument you are going to hear and that many people actually say when they are being faced with that counter argument is that since he's not training for aesthetics, that makes it okay. So for some reason, if your main goal is aesthetics and you get aesthetic that's gay, but if your main goal is body is like uh, Krav Maga or it's kickboxing, and while you do that, you get aesthetic, now that's not gay. It's like the no homo of aesthetics because you just got it as a byproduct. I will never understand that. To me, if you go to bake a pie and you bake a cake, you still baked a fucking cake. Your intentions don't matter. Only the consequences do. do. It is, in truth, a childish mindset, and it's what we call une pirouette de l'esprit, mental gymnastics in English. It's a guy who convinced himself that aesthetics are gay, but he also wants to look more aesthetic, so what does he do? He tries to find a way around it. So he says, well, yes, I do body weight movements that make me look better, but I do them to be more, uh, more functional as an athlete, so it doesn't count. Well, yeah, but you still got more aesthetics based on that, and most likely the reason why you keep doing them is because they make you more aesthetic. I'm not going to touch the steroid accusations. Apparently, the guy has dabbled. I would not be surprised. The majority of masculinity gurus are on some form or another of steroids because it's part of the package to look better, to look more alpha, quote unquote. But if that's the case, the guy is absolutely a fucking hypocrite because steroids make you look better. That's the reason why people do steroids. And you can't even use the argument of it's to be better at combat at martial arts because he has retired from martial arts. So if he takes steroids, it's a hundred percent for vanity. But you know, I'm not surprised by this type of childish mindset. Well, going back on the gay thing, I think that this entire argumentation I just presented to you guys is worthless. I could have stopped at the fact that the guy is an adult and he still uses gay to point at things that he dislikes. Middle school is long gone. I think this type of behavior is not homophobic. I don't care about that. It's just plain stupid. It is plainly the sign of someone who likes vocabulary and who is incapable of actually articulating his thoughts. He could have done the job I just did right now of breaking himself down on a psychological level and trying to have the self-awareness to understand why bodybuilding makes him so uncomfortable. But instead, he resorted to call it gay. 
And that is really the gist of his argument. Andrew Tate dislikes something, therefore that thing is gay, and that is it. It means it's bad, and the argument is over. And it also tells all about him. You know, when we insult others, we call them the thing that we fear the most. We fear being the most. This is the reason why, for me, the worst thing I can call you is retard, because it's what I would hate to be. I would hate to be a retard, because it would be really hard to be born in a body and to be cursed with a low level of intellect and nothing to do against it. With Tate, because he resents bodybuilders, he calls them the worst thing he can think of, which is gay. That also says a lot about the guy. If the worst thing you can be called is gay, you are deeply insecure in your heterosexuality. You can call me gay all day long, I don't give a fuck. I know I like women and that is it. You can call me miss, you can call me cis, it doesn't change my life, I'm still a man. I'm sure that uh, Tate is actually extremely mad when you, call, when you call him gay. That is the sign of someone whose masculinity is extremely fragile. And it's very common. Middle school, high school, you want to start a fight, you call the other guy gay. You are certain to actually get the guy riled up. And that explains why a large portion of his audience are middle and high schoolers. It's because they can relate to him, which is not a good sign, right? If the bulk of your audience are teenagers or preteens and they can relate to you on a spiritual level, it means it's time to grow up. This level of immaturity is extremely common, again, amongst masculinity gurus, and we're also going to get back to that. It could be that it's just because it's the way Andrew Tate is, he is in, in arrested development, he's a mind child, or it could be because it's a strategy aimed at grooming his audience towards obedience, which both, which would be more sinister, but I think both would be equally as pathetic. Now, there is a follow-up statement that is going to close this portion of the video, and one that many people haven't discussed, and I think this one is just as interesting as the gay thing. Andrew Tate also called bodybuilders pussies. And the reasons he gave also give us a lot of information about what he thinks, the way he thinks, and the way he perceives the world around him. Because he stated that all bodybuilders are just felt fighters. So in his head, if you bodybuild, it's because you want to fight, but you're too cowardly and too pussy to fight, so you're going to do a different sport instead, one that is going to protect you because you're going to look so tough that no one is going to want to fight you. That's actually quite interesting, and I think he even made a solid point saying that many people who bodybuild don't really want to be bodybuilders. It's also something I think about many people who do strength sports or martial arts, where you look at them and you think, okay, I think you would have preferred not having to do that, but you are not good enough at other endeavors to end up doing this. It's my theory regarding bodybuilding and Andrew Tate. I think he wanted to look better, felt miserably, and therefore he went into something else. Now, I have no proof, but he also has no proof. The issue is that in this case, as I said, it is built off of resentment, and therefore it looks to me like a projection. It looks to me like something that he thinks, and he's trying to point out at bodybuilders and say that they're like this because, again, it makes him feel better. I don't know if he realizes when he speaks how transparent he is, I would say no, because I've met many people in my time who don't realize how much they reveal about themselves when they open their mouth. They give so much of their cards, they are complete open books, and the worst part is that they're not even aware of it, and worse of that, they don't, they're not even aware of who they are. They don't even realize where all of that insecurity comes from, and yet it is very easy to perceive for someone who is looking at it from the outside. Now, I want to make sure that I get a point across, a very important point. Fighting is a noble pursuit. I'm not going to sit there and play the blame game and cut the nuance in half and tell you that no, no, bodybuilding is great and fighters are pussies, felt bodybuilders. I don't believe that for a second. As I told you, I did martial arts. I love them greatly. The reason why I personally did not do martial arts and didn't continue in that path is because I lack the bloodlust and the necessary aggressivity to be good at them. I think it's a necessary gift if you want to be really good. I've always preferred bodybuilding. Does that make me a pussy? Maybe, but we're going to see that uh, I believe this to be an antiquated vision of masculinity. Now, if we're going to talk about masculinity, I want to go back on martial arts and the type of people that engage in them. Because as I said, fighting is a noble pursuit. And some of the people I respect the most, some of my senseis, were fighters and they fought for 40, 50 years. These were great men. They found in fighting the ability to fight themselves. 
I think that this is what makes the difference between the virtuous fighter and the asshole. The virtuous fighter is not in it to hurt other people. He's in it to, to better himself and to become a better man. And if that takes getting into the ring and fighting another dude, then so be it. It is part of the process. But there are also the other ones. Anyone who has done martial arts has met these two types. They have met the guys that are confident and they have met the other ones. In truth, you don't even need to do martial arts. You will meet dudes in your life who are going to be very confident in themselves and then you're going to meet dudes who are going to want to fight you on every single chance they get because they want to prove a point. They want to prove something. They want to feel better about themselves. These are not confident guys. If you go around shaking your fist and trying to fight every dude at the bar, no one looks at you and thinks, oh, what a self-assured alpha male. No, they think, wow, what a better bitch. That guy is not able to be comfortable with who he is. He, he needs to fight all the time. Why fight? I personally will only fight to protect my loved ones. I will not even fight to protect myself. I will run away, even if I can take you in a fight. That's confidence. I'm not going to engage you in your weird ego battle. But I think that this is what Tate was pointing out here, which, please tell me if I'm wrong, is very weird from the pro fighters. Pro fighters, for the most part, respect the sport, and they're not going to go out of their way to beat up random civilians. Actually, the ones that do tend to be assholes and they tend to not really be the ones that are the most virtuous. If you heard about a pro boxer who antagonized someone in a bar just to be able to beat him up, would you respect that guy? How is that respectable? You're going head to head against someone who is not trained in your practice. I think that this is the sign of someone who is deeply insecure and got in martial arts to be able to humiliate other men. And I think that this is what distinguishes these two types. There are dudes that use their skills to dominate other men in order to feel better about themselves. These are the types that to me do not best represent martial arts. If anything, they represent the dark part of martial arts because they only engage in them to compensate for their insecurity. What they should have done instead is working on bettering themselves to be at peace with their body without having to try and build up another man to feel good about themselves. And guess what? This is the reason why bodybuilding is so great. Bodybuilding allows you to make peace with the body work even at birth, and now you can stop being an angsty little asshole and stop fighting others. I was like this growing up, I got bullied, I started becoming very aggressive and prone to fights, and then I got to a point where even when I wasn't being bullied, I attacked others. I went from being the bullied and being the victim to being the aggressor, and the only thing that got me out of this spiral of self-destruction was to fix my body, was to bodyboard and look better. And now I am at a point in my life where if I can spend the rest of my days not hurting a fly, I will do it because I have the privilege of being able to do so. I'm mentally secure and I do not feel the need to dominate or humiliate other people with my fists anymore. I'm glad I am at that point. Looking at something, someone like Andrew Tate, he clearly has some work to do. But I think that his words are dangerous because they are going to push people towards martial arts with the wrong message. When he says things like this, he's going to encourage people to start boxing, kickboxing, jujitsu, not to fix themselves and to be better themselves, but to be able to put other people down. This is, prepare yourself, toxic masculinity. I know that the term is overused nowadays, but to me that's a telltale example of that. Instead of building people up, no, you want to be the asshole and the top dog that is just going to discharge his insecurity onto other people. Issue is, there's no good outcomes to that because you cannot cope your way into being a better man. You have to actually become one. And that is why both paths, bodybuilding and martial arts, are valid as long as you pursue them for the right reasons. If I met a guy who bodybuilded to put other people down, calling other people small, I would say that this, people, this man is just as toxic because he entirely missed the point. And Tate also states that bodybuilders toughen themselves up to avoid fights, as I said previously. The question I have here is, why is that a bad thing? I mean, if you do that because you have a deep-rooted fear of conf confrontation, you should really try to fix that fear because you're going to be confronted by outside forces at some point in your life. But if you do that because you just want to be left alone like I did, again, why is it a bad thing? Why am I supposed to be the guy that takes every, uh, every other opportunity I have to get into fights? Why can't I instead work on myself and try to avoid fights as much as possible? And what is the best way to avoid a fight? 
and to be able to finish it, or at least to put in people's head the idea that you can finish it. When I was weak and small, it's when I got in fights the most often, because people would pick fights with me all the time, and I did not like that. In a sense, Tate is correct. I did not want to fight. So what was the solution? Well, to just get bigger. Because I was tired of being beaten up? No, because I was tired of fighting, period. My life as a man should not be to either crush someone or get crushed. I think that this is, again, an antiquated vision of masculinity. And a dangerous one at that, because you put that type of message in people's head, young guys who might not have the best influences in their life, who might live in rough neighborhoods, now you... It, you impress upon them the fact that their lifestyle is okay and that trying to fight people is good. Some neighborhoods, you get into the wrong fight, you're dead, right? I, I don't know if he ever got into street fights. I hope he did because of the type of advice he gives, but a street fight is not the ring. There's no one to stop the fight. Yet there's people with knives. I don't care if you have 15 black belts. If I come from behind with a glass bottle and I smash it on your head, that's it. You're on the ground. You're my thing. I can do with you whatever I want. This is not the type of advice to give men, to just tell them to fight recklessly like this. If you can bodybuild and avoid even the necessity of the fight, absolutely do it. That would reduce the amount of risk that you take. And keep in mind that, unlike what some people think, we are not aggressive monkeys, we are not simply troglodytes, we have evolved. Okay, we are modern men, we are educated, sophisticated men, meaning what? Mean that we should try to reduce the amount of violence used as much as possible. No, as to, so as not to vilify violence, violence has its place in society, but try to make use of it when it's absolutely necessary. If you can avoid the use of violence, I think that this is something that is actually quite smart, because you also avoid unnecessary risks. It's what I said with the, the street fights. The issue with street fights is that you don't know if you're going to win. And unlike a fight in a ring, if you lose a street fight, it could be over. You could be stabbed, you could be shot. I mean, the guy lives in the UK, he grew up in the UK, so maybe he lived in an environment where the worst thing that can happen to you in a street fight is you get knocked out. I grew up in places where you would get stabbed. 14-year-olds had knives on them. You start a fight with the wrong guy, you get stabbed, your life is over. I'm not going to risk my life for some bullshit ego. I will only put it on the line if it is necessary and if it is something that leaves me absolutely no choice. And then if we're going to go back to the more evolutionary standpoint and the evolutionary psychology of fights, understand that preserving your energy and avoiding risk is also smart. It's how our species got where it is. We did not get to where we are by being reckless. The reckless one got extinguished a long time ago. Risk-taking behaviors are rewarded when the risk is also allied with intellect and some level of thinking. If, again, you just go baboon-like every time there is a fight, you're not going to be the type of guy who's going to live a long life. You're most likely not going to be the type of guy who is going to leave a legacy behind because you are going to die. So that was my small message. For the people who are going to take that at face value, Developing your muscularity so as to avoid fights by creating an intimidation factor is the best thing you can do, especially if you live in a quote-unquote bad neighborhood or a rough neighborhood. As Machiavelli said, never attempt to win by force what can be won by deception. This is actually a quote that I live by, and it's the quote that made me want to get bigger. There's another one that I forgot, but I'm going to paraphrase it as closely as I can, again by Machiavelli, who said that, a man that looks powerful is powerful. Power resides where men think it does. What does it mean? A guy looks at you and thinks, okay, this is a bad motherfucker. He's tough. I'm not going to start a fight with him. Guess what? It does not matter if you know how to fight or not. What matters is that the guy thinks you do. And just like that, you avoided a fight. Predators do not go for lions. They go for prey. They go for victims. If you don't look like a victim, you're going to avoid a fight. If that makes me a pussy, so be it. I just don't want to get in 15 fights a day. And I think that most men can agree with me. I think that Ted himself would agree with me. I think that his statement is based purely on the assumption that a fight means fighting in the ring. A fight on the street, you don't control anything and you will not be the victor every single time. I can guarantee you that. Muscles buy you peace. And guess what? Martial arts also do. It's why... 
Beyond the fact that the guy has won several titles and is a good fighter, he clearly understands absolutely nothing about martial arts because he treats them as a knife when in reality they are a shield. One of the best martial artists out there will tell you that starting martial arts is not to be able to crush your opponent, but it's to develop the confidence so as, not so as to not be forced into a fight. You can use bodybuilding in the exact same fashion. And actually the best would be to do both. Look intimidating, look like you can fight, and then also develop the ability to fight, and now you are Gucci. So that was for the first part of this video that concerned itself with proving that bodybuilding isn't gay, that the type of people who say that are like Andrew Tate, people who just discharge their hate of aesthetics on a practice they understand nothing about, and also the fact that calling bodybuilders pussies was also completely unnecessary, but also based on nothing but an attempt at pissing people off and getting a reaction. All of that was just Andrew Tate using pro bodybuilding as a straw man to target everyone who, lo who lives for looks, while at the same time proving himself to be an hypocrite because he himself lives for looks and engages in vanity, exposing himself as a half-wit while also muddying the name of martial arts in the meanwhile because he followed up the footsteps of so many people, so many men who are insecure about their masculinity, who jumped on martial arts because they thought that was going to make them more masculine and tough, and that just ends up revealing to the world the level of destruction that the type of men that detest themselves can wield if you put a weapon in their hand. Now we are going to move to part two, which is the psychological breakdown of Andrew Tate. After everything I just explained, it is hard to wrap your head around the fact that Andrew Tate might very well be one of the most famous male influencers on the planet right now. And therefore, for this psychological breakdown, I have one question. How did this man become so popular in masculine circles? By doing that, it's going to help us break down Andrew Tate on a psychological level, but also help us understand the reason why so many men selected him as their role model. So first and foremost, let's look at the early life of Andrew Tate. His claim to fame is the fact that he was a very successful kickboxing champion, and there is absolutely no denying that. That is not a lie. He was actually a very strong fighter. But that is an important part of the reason why he got popular in the first place. Many men look up to him because they see the alpha chat, the guy who broke down other men, and they think to themselves, okay, this is a desirable trait to possess. I wish it could be me. Therefore, this means that this guy is worth following because he has something that I want. This is a typical strategy put in place by masculinity gurus. This is the reason why they always have pretty girls around them. They always have cigars. They always have money. They always flash their possessions. They know that you want that. So their goal is to show it to you. But keep in mind that sometimes, this is not the case here, but sometimes it is an illusion. They don't actually possess these things. But paradoxically, by you believing they do, you're going to buy into their bullshit, which is eventually going to allow them to purchase the thing that they wanted. This is how vicious the entire thing is and why I want you to be very careful with that type of mindset. Just because Andrew Tate possesses something that you think is masculine and positive does not make him a good man. Something that the people who elected him as their role model seem to forget. Times and times again, I've seen that in the past, men with some shady characters who get massive amounts of popularity amongst young men because they might be very muscular or they might have a pretty girlfriend, they have a pretty car. But what you don't see is the dark underbelly underneath, and that is what we're going to be looking at right now. There are lots of top-level fighters that are pieces of shit. An example that I like to use is John Jones. If you look at John Jones' career and his persona in the media, what he attempts to be, you'd think that the guy has everything, right? He's tall, he's muscular, he's one of the best fighters on earth, he can destroy anyone. But then look at who the guy is actually. He's a coke fiend, he almost murdered a pregnant woman, he is completely incapable of taking care of others, he has beaten up his wife several times. Everything that, according to me, makes him a terrible person and someone that should be buried underneath the prison. And yet, 
He still has millions of fans and people who love him. Not because he's a fighter. We're not dealing with people who separate the artist from the man. They love him unconditionally. And it's the exact thing with Tate. But the problem is that Tate is an influencer. Therefore, the character he showcases should be close to the truth. You can't hide behind the comedy thing, something that Tate has done. This is something that foreshadows all of the darkness I'm going to be unfolding right now, but Ted himself has stated that he plays a character. Tell yourself that the next time you're going to blindly follow an influencer. You're dealing with someone who respects you so little that they sell you a gimmick, a facade, a character, and then when you're going to fall for it and destroy your life because you follow their advice, they'll just shrug their shoulders and say, eh, it was just a character, kid. You fooled yourself, it's not my problem. Keep that in mind. You have to develop some level of ability to see beyond the mask because in your life as a man, you will meet a lot of high achievers who deep down are going to be terrible people. And the only way to distinguish between the good and the bad and raw deep is to look at their motivations. Do not just listen to what they tell you they are. Look at what they actually do because this is what, this is, what is going to reveal them for what they actually are. And this is exactly what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to remove the Andrew Tate mask and I'm going to show you the creature underneath. If we look at things at face value, we see someone who is a very good fighter. But as I told you, the motivations for why Tate started fighting might be darker than you think. We could say, for example, that he started fighting because he wanted to make up for his insecurities. It's an option, an hypothesis, that I offered to explain why he would call something like bodybuilding gay. But there actually might be something more sinister at hand here because when I was digging through some of his past interviews, I found a certain passage that supported a completely different version of the truth. You see, Andrew's father, Emery Tate, was a chess international master, meaning that he was a decently good player. And Tate also played as a kid. And when he was a kid, when he was five or six, he won a tournament. And years afterwards, when he recalled that fact, he was quoted to say that, I remember when I won. The 15-year-old I beat cried and it made me happy. I was so happy, not that I won, but that I made him cry. This is Tate talking about his victory, which I would assume is a formative memory for him. It's interesting that young him already showcased certain signs of, if not sociopathic traits, some level of sadism. For a five-year-old to relish in watching a teenager cry is extremely weird, and I think most people would refrain from actually sharing that type of details about their life, but it seems to me that Tate is so confident that you're not going to be able to see through the mask that he's willing to indulge in that type of details. Someone like me picks up on it immediately, but apparently most people when they follow influencers don't even take five seconds to look at the guy's life and to try to see what he really is. In this case, there's not much digging to be done because the guy himself tells him who he is. But if you're unwilling to listen to me or to him, just look at the details of his life. I think that this in particular, again, shows that he at least possesses some level of antisocial personality disorder, which might explain why he likes fighting so much. Remember when I told you that there's two types of fighter? There's a third type I never spoke about because these guys are very rare, but these are the dudes who enjoy blood. They don't do it to better themselves. They don't do it because they have a thing to prove. They have a ship on their shoulders. They do it because they just like to hurt other people. I've met some people like this. You don't want to be around these people. They are actually very dangerous. I'm not saying that to completely assassinate Andrew Tate's character. I know it's something he likes to complain about, that the narrative around his name is soiled. I think he's soiling it himself. I think that this is simply a possibility in this case. But I also now understand why he doesn't like bodybuilding. In bodybuilding, no one dies and no one gets hurt. I also remember him complaining that bodybuilders whine too much about not being able to eat. And I think that this also shows a complete lack of empathy on his part. When other people express discomfort, it pisses him off. It's interesting to say the least. I don't think it's because he wants people to be tougher. I think that it's because he perceives any level of weakness expressed by others like blood in the water and it just excites him.
This is personally what I have perceived. And unlike what you might think, this is not the sign of a high IQ. I know it's because of Hollywood, people conflate being a psychopath or a sociopath, which has nothing to do with one another, with being a high IQ and being very intelligent. It doesn't work like that. Yes, there are people who are high IQ and who also possess some level of antisocial personality disorder, but it is most common that these people are actually lower on the IQ spectrum. Not that it means a ton, but it's just to let you know that, unlike what Andrew Tate might be saying, he doesn't have like genius IQ. Again, in one of his interviews, he stated that he was good at chess because his dad was good at chess. So somehow it made them both intelligent. First and foremost, being good at chess has nothing to do with intelligence. Yes, the top champions tend to be high IQ, but for the most part, if you just learn certain openings and you learn strategy and tactics, you're going to be able to climb. And someone like Tate peaked at, I think, 18,000 ELO, which is not high at all. I mean, you start being considered strong around 24,000 ELO, and the top players are 26,000, 27,000. His dad was 24,000. He has the ELO of someone who would be mediocre. And for someone who started playing when he was a kid and, he, and who had a, an international master as a fighter, it's actually not that high. So it's not the Andrew Tate gene, the Tate gene that he likes to brag about that made him smart. It's just that anyone can get to that level if you just practice. What I think this shows, however, is that he possesses a complete lack of empathy and overall disregard for others, which is concerning. I think you would agree with me on this when you are supposed to be an influencer that is there to help other people. If you don't care about others and you possess a complete inability to tap into their feelings, how exactly are you going to do your job properly? We're going to get back to that, but uh, I think that it is the reason why he's so good at what he does. It's because he actually doesn't give a fuck about the people he talks to or the people he pretends to be helping. He's just in it for his own sake. And people who are like this, of course, tend to have a very easy time climbing hierarchy ladders because other people's feelings aren't that important to them. This is why a lot of people who are high in managerial positions, many CEOs, are sociopaths. It doesn't mean that they are more intelligent. It just means that, unlike you, they are willing to step on other people's heads to get to the top because they have no empathy whatsoever. They simply do not care. They don't feel guilt. And this is an incredible advantage. It's also an incredible advantage in the ring. It might be why he is so good. It's because he doesn't care about hurting others. Now, it, I don't say that to take away from his accomplishments. Again, it's just part of the psychological portrait I'm trying to make so that you understand the person, the person that we are actually talking about. And I think that this is not too far-fetched because if we're talking about hierarchies and about business environments, Tate himself has started several business ventures after retiring from combat sports, of course. He, first and foremost, participated in reality TV, where he attempted to make it as a celebrity, which shows that the, the, the guy likes fame. The guy is attracted to fame. He's not in it for you. He's in it because he likes the spotlight and he likes the attention. He is, as we say, an attention whore. These types, as I said, are dangerous because when they run out of things to say, they are addicted to attention. They will say whatever and do whatever. It does not mean that what they're saying is intelligent or that it's going to benefit your life. They're doing that because without the attention, they cannot live. And it's the same again for reality TV. Now, the type of people who are attracted by reality TV and who want to be part of it tend to be people who are narcissistic to a degree or another. I know I'm throwing a lot of psychological terms at you. I'm not trying to tell you that the guy is a narcissistic psychopath. I'm just saying that he showcases traits that point to him having some level of disorder, a disorder that makes him unfit as an influencer, unfit as a guy. If you, as we say in French, au royaume des aveugles, les bornes sont rois, I think that it also exists in English. If you follow a blind man, you are most likely going to end up falling off a cliff. But this is also confirmed by the caliber of men that tend to make it very high in the influencer circles. Sometimes I sit back and I think to myself, okay, how do we end, how do we end up with guys like this in positions of power times and times again? How is it that we never have dudes who are wholesome, dudes who are looking out for other men, dudes who are influential but who also can be kind, people who give tough love. Why do these dudes never make it to the top? Why do they never become big on Instagram? And it's because these guys tend to not have what it takes to make it that big and what it takes is 
complete disregard of other people's feelings and also a deep craving for attention. Is it any wonder that environments that encourage narcissistic disorders tend to also privilege the development and the blooming of the type of people that showcase these disorders? If you win at a reality TV show game, it's not because you're more intelligent or the best, it's because within that environment you possess all of the necessary qualities to make it. Now, unfortunately for Andrew Tate, he got kicked out of Big Brother because he said something racist or sexist. I don't remember and I really don't care. This is not the point of my argument. But that is one of the first things that Andrew Tate attempted to do after retiring from combat sports. And like what some people might think, and it's another thing I would like to debunk in terms of psychology, just like with sociopaths and psychopaths that aren't necessarily more intelligent, people who are narcissistic are not people who have very high self-esteem. Actually, it's the exact opposite. These people tend to have low self-esteem. They feed themselves and they feed their ego via others. This is why they tend to lack attention so much. I said all of that because what follows after the attempt at reality TV is quite disturbing, but when you listen to all the things I presented previously, it makes total sense. You see, after flunking out of Big Brothers, he started a webcam studio business with his brother, where he would hire girls to chat up with distraught clients. So essentially the business model was get some of his girlfriends in a room, get them cameras, get them computers, and these people would call men, they would, they would pinpoint and target lonely men, and they would try to scam these men out of their money by trying to bait them with a female voice, a female presence. Now, answer me this. Let's say you have a brother and you're going to start a business with him. Is this your first idea of a business? What type of scum would think of something so devoid of morality and virtue, something so sinister to be able to make money? And that's not me saying it, by the way, it's Tate himself. Tate himself described his business as a total scam, aimed to defraud lonely men of their money by luring them in with sub-stories. So essentially, this is a guy that states that his life mission is to help men who made millions, again, according to him, by scamming men who are looking for affection by bedding them in with a female voice and then getting them to enter their credit card information because the girl would tell them a story about how if they don't get 200 pounds, they would get expelled from a country or they would get arrested by the police. How does that compute again in your head? If you're someone who likes Andrew Tate, how do you support the guy and take advice from him knowing that he preyed on the type of guy that you could very well be or that you could have become? This again, is a proof that the guy does not care about the emotions of others. He does not care about destroying the life of other men if it means benefiting himself. He did that for money. He did that just for money. He was willing to stoop that low, which truly demonstrates a complete lack of virtue, a staggering amount of greed, but also the complete absence of empathy that I already described. And this has never really stopped because all I just described has been continuing, but just under a different form. It is still perfectly in line with current online presence that hinges on manipulating men with low confidence and no sense of purpose by baiting them with promises, then taking their money. Back in the day, he used to put up a front, have a girl talk to you about love and marriage and store as much of your cash as possible. Nowadays, he does the same thing without the girl, he uses his own image and he tells you that he can turn you into an alpha, into a more confident man, that surprise, surprise, is going to be super attractive to ladies. He takes your money and then you are left with nothing, le bec dans l'eau, as we say in French. And the proof I have of that is also undeniable. He started an online school called Oslo's University, right, mark the name, where he charges young men to receive seminars about dropshipping and crypto trading, both which are complete scams. Anyone who knows anything about the economy knows that this is not a sustainable way to make money, and most people who engage in it lose money. It's a scheme. Only the top percent make money out of crypto trading. 
But those people also know that for the scheme to keep running, they need pigeons and idiots like you to invest in it. So they make videos saying how easy it is to become a millionaire by buying Dogecoin or whatever the fuck. You buy it, you lose all of your money, and they make more money. All of that again benefits only the people that promote these practices and never the people that actually follow them. Worst, the worst in this scenario is that for anyone who, who enrolled themselves in Hustlers University, you would be paying for this. You would be paying for courses that will eventually make you completely bankrupt. I find this very interesting considering that, again, Tate is supposed to be anti-modernity, but when it comes to taking your money, he is 100% pro-modernity. Nothing can be more modern than usury using cryptocurrency. But since it's going to make him very rich, in that case, he can just tuck all of his good ideals in his back pocket. And since people apparently don't pay attention to ideological consistency, it is going to go completely unnoticed. I personally noticed, and I think it is absolutely ridiculous. Tate also introduced an affiliate program where members could receive a commission by recruiting new members, also known as a pyramid scheme. The guy is running a masculine MLM, and you're none the wiser. Last I checked, 10,000 people fell for it. 10,000 men clicked on Hustlers University, saw Andrew Tate, and thought, hmm, you know what, that looks like a good degree to get, that looks like a good investment. I think this is why videos like this are important, is because you could think that this is a given. Personally, after 20 seconds of listening to him, I knew the guy was a fraud. But apparently it's not evident. Clearly it's not because he is not the first one to run that type of scheme. It's old now. There's been dozens of dudes doing that. And these guys get massive online. They have a massive court following. How? Well, it's because I think that the average man doesn't think. The average man isn't super able to perceive that level of discrepancy between words pronounced and actual personality and actions. So it is needed to create exposés such as this one, so as to make sure that this type of strategy and practice stops working. Will it actually do anything? I don't know. The stupidity of man is truly infinite. But here is where I want to stop for a second, because we are getting an answer to our first question. I introduced this segment by asking how it was possible for such a man to get so popular. And part of the answer is because people are stupid and they don't pay attention. But the other part is also because I found out that Andrew Tate himself encouraged the members of his university to spam social media with videos of him. So now it makes total sense. Why did he appear out of nowhere? When I looked at Google searches, the guy didn't exist two years ago. He appeared out of thin air and he became a massive hit immediately. Why? Because there were thousands of people artificially inflating his image on the internet, posting videos of him, posting his name times and times again, which created a snowball effect and made, it, made him the success and the, in reality, the, the phenomenon that he has become nowadays. But it also points to him being a cultist. He is someone who has started an actual personality cult. When you get people under your wing and you tell them to spam your visage and spam your voice everywhere, yeah, that's called a cult. The guy is like discount Jesus without the beard and the long hair, except instead of starting a massive religion that carries some positive virtues, he just started a pyramid scheme that benefits him and only him which tends to be the case for courts, by the way, that's some sort of the gist of the court. The only person that benefits from said court is the court leader. The rest does absolutely nothing. They just become slave to the court leader. But that is perfectly in line with his personality and explains his popularity. Only someone so narcissistic and devoid of empathy would be so delusional as to ask his followers to do something like this. And of course, it functioned. And why did it function? because our society is now dictated by algorithms. I don't know if you have noticed, but nowadays this is really what makes you consume a certain type of content over another one. You are not really choosing what you watch. The robots select something and they show it to you. If enough people, enough young men, click on things that look like it would interest you, it will eventually be shown to you and at some point you are going to click. It is the law of numbers and the law of numbers dictates 
that viral internet figures scarcely deserve their popularity for reasons I explained before. Who else but a complete maniac and someone who is borderline sociopathic would ask their followers to do something like this? Well, only someone like Andrew Tate. And therefore, the only people that make it to the top are the people willing to use such methods, which tend to be people devoid of virtue, that then become role models followed by younger men who develop themselves after their image and become themselves men with no virtue. This is why I think it's so dangerous. This is what the algorithm has created. The algorithm doesn't have a way to look at people who are going to benefit your life. They just look at the big hitters, who gets the most numbers, who gets the most click. If it's a guy that is going to teach you that eating cigarettes is good for you because it makes you an alpha, that is going to get recommended. If you don't believe me, look at Liver King. Here is a guy who recommends eating raw meat, who is clearly on steroids, who has some unhinged ideas about modernity and how to live as a man. The guy is making millions of dollars, he has millions of followers. Why? Because the algorithm promoted him. That starts and ends there. You can hate it as much as you want, but that is the law of the land. We now live in what I call, and if I manage to pronounce it the first time, I deserve a medal, an algorithmitocracy. Okay, close enough, an algorithmitocracy as opposed to a meritocracy. We now live in a world where the algorithm decides who makes it. People who makes it tend to be bad people. The bad people tend to be more influential and they create more bad people. And the cycle continues again, again, and again. Then I have no hope of it actually stopping unless we destroy the matrix. But that is a different discussion. The question I have, however, is this. Even if the algorithm feeds you a type of content, how come so many men like him so much? You know, I've been fed videos from Andrew Tate. I've been fed videos from Dan Bilzerian, from Lever King. I clicked on them and within 15 seconds, I was like, oh, so this is what it means to be retarded. And then I clicked off and I lived my life. But some of you guys actually fell for the meme. How is it possible? Well, it's because Andrew Tate and all of these guys know what they are doing. They're not just playing the algorithm. They're also playing you with their social persona. What they do, you see, is that they target a very specific type of men. The incels, the men going their own way, and other types of outcasts. Now, I want to make clear that by saying that, I'm not saying that to make you feel bad about yourself. And at this point, anyone who says anything remotely negative about women is an incel. If you refuse to say you're a man going their own way, I'm not saying that in that fashion. I'm saying that because there is definitely a category of men that tend to be very young men who resent women, resent the system, resent their place in society, want to find a way to make it, and these are the types of men that, that influencers like Andrew Tate target because you are looking for something and they're there to offer you something. Men like me are looking for nothing. The only thing that can be offered to me is more spirituality, it's more enlightenment, and someone like Tate cannot offer that to me. So I'm never going to be the target demographic of that guy because you are young, you're the target demographic and you have to be on your guard because any frustration you might have in you will be noticed by these types and they will target them so that they fester even more. This is something I'm going to say only once. It's out of context, but I want you to take it to heart as much as possible. Men like Tate look at you and perceive someone who is not doing well. Do they offer an answer and do they offer a solution afterwards? Of course not. Why? Because if they manage to make you feel better about yourself, they would lose you as a potential client. So what do they do? They engage in something called alienation. Alienation is someone who is not fulfilling the role that they perceive they should be fulfilling. This is your state right now. Most modern men are alienated. They feel no purpose, no direction, and they hate their life. Following someone like Tate is not going to resolve that. He has no reason to resolve it because if he resolves it, he loses you. As I said, I'll say it only one time, but this is true for most influencers. They are not there to offer you a solution. They are there to offer you a false hope that you can climb on so that they can then profit from you. And this is something that the outcast I just described also did. Paradoxically, you see in Andrew Tate and all of these guys a hope, 
a hope to make it, a hope to become the top dogs of a system that you hate because you perceive that the system hates you. Meaning what? Meaning that we are dealing with a system that is based off of resentment. It is your resentment that makes you follow these types. Do you think that your resentment is a good guide? The answer is absolutely not, as I already explained. These dudes will just reinforce your resentment because they know that you're going to double down on their online presence afterwards. And that, by the way, summarizes hustle culture. Hustle culture is being built exclusively on your alienation. Why do you hustle? Because you want to make it. You want to make it out of what? Out of the system that oppresses you and that makes you feel like you're just a cog in the machine. By doing what? By working more. When are you going to understand that hustle culture is just another method that the system has put in place to make you work more, to make you become more part of the machine? Guys like Andrew Tate, guys like all of these influencers, they are not anti-establishment. They work for the system and they benefit from it tremendously. They do not wish to break the status quo. They make too much money off of the status quo. But your liberation and emancipation would only come from the destruction of the status quo, a status quo that you reinforce because you work for it. I'm not going to make a full video on alienation. It's a very important topic and at some point I might tackle it. But I wanted to interject that idea because this is the gist of it. This is why so many men like Tate. He represents what they perceive to be a solution, but in reality, it's not a solution at all. And the same can be said for his sexist rants. I know for a fact that many young men like him because of his views on women. Why? Because it echoes your own views. But why exactly do you have these views? Well, I think that it's not because you're a bad person. It's not because you are a bigot. It's because you are afraid of women, don't lie to me. You're afraid of speaking to women. You're afraid they're going to hurt you or reject you. And most importantly, you are anxious because you are afraid you are going to spend the rest of your life alone. You see that as something that women did to you because they reject you, they don't want you, and therefore you have come to detest them. Is it their fault? No, it is your fault. The problem is within you. But see how with Tate, it's always the same thing. He takes an issue within himself he should have fixed and he projects onto others. And now you cannot fix the problem anymore. And it's something I see with what I call insults and men going their own way all the time. These are dudes that could have a very happy life if they just faced their problems, but instead they decided that all of their issues was because of the system or because of women. Men like Tate are there to reinforce that view and to make you think that you are correct. They will tell you that you are absolutely right, that women are evil, they're just after your money, but at the same time making you work for money to attract women. Can I stop with the contradictions or are you starting to understand that we're dealing with people who are hypocritical and don't even understand their own ideology? All of that, all of these brands, echo the detestation of women. And ultimately, all of that is based off of the same fear and resentment of being rejected that you share. I'm not going to go too far into details here because it's just ad hominems for the sake of ad hominems. But if you look at Tate, the guy is not good looking at all. He went bored very early on. He is a complete egghead. His one saving grace is that he is 6'3 and that he is now massively famous. But I can perfectly envision a young Andrew Tate that was very unpopular with women and therefore started to develop some level of resentment. A level of resentment he's taking out on them right now because now he has power over them. The fact he utilized women to make money in cam shows or cam girl situations, whatever, shows that his relationships with women is absolutely tainted. He projects that onto you because you follow his advice and you like his advice because, again, it echoes with what you feel. The question then is, what results do you expect from following his ideology? It's an honest question. What do you think is going to happen if you follow the advice of a man that clearly detests women think they are inferior and think that any level of relationship is going to involve the man being superior and the woman being treated as some form of object. Do you think this is a realistic representation of heterosexual relationships? Do you think that this is something that is achievable for you? And is it even something that you want? I can tell you for a fact that after having listened to that guy, Andrew Tate, I started to repeat the dude because I can tell that he will never be able to fall in love with a woman. He might get married 
to some poor chick that is going to fall for the fame and the money. He might even have children, but he will never fall in love for the woman that he marries because I think he's incapable of loving. Maybe he can love his brothers, maybe he, he loved his father, but a woman in his life, impossible. And this is immediately evident when you listen to the way he speaks about them. There is absolutely no love here. There is only resentment and hatred. And I am afraid that this is going to confront some men in that type of lifestyle as well. The issue is that unlike Tate that benefits from your adoration, you're not going to have the level of resources that he has. He can get by because women are always going to fall for fame and money, but you have none of these things. So what are you left with? Now you're going to be an insult that embraces his detestation of women. So essentially you're going to be alone for the rest of your life. Is it what you signed up for when you started this? Or are you going to be the type of guy that is just going to use women and then just dump them on the side? But if that's the case, aren't you also just expressing your resentment? Deep down, what you wanted is to be able to fall in love with a girl that she would love you back and then you would be able to construct and build something with her. And now you're going to treat them like cum rags as a revenge, as a real revenge scenario in your head. Even if you get to that, do you think it's going to make you happy? There's no need to answer that in raw. The, the answer is of course not. But I want to point at the hypocrisy and the irony of a man who is telling you that bettering your body apparently makes you gay but then who preaches and promotes a lifestyle that is completely divorced from women. Isn't that the gayest thing possible? Last I checked, being gay means that you're only going to hang with other dudes because it's dudes that you want to bang. Most gay dudes don't really like women that much. Sexism and misogyny is rampant amongst gay dudes. Why? Because they don't really want to have anything to do with women. They don't want to bang them. They don't want to have a life with them. You're going to become that. Men going their own way is mostly that, but the issue is that you're a hypocrite. This is why I said that the entire rant about bodybuilders being pussies because no one really wants to be a bodybuilder, they wanted to be fighters, struck me as sincere but also very stupid because Tate failed to understand how much he was revealing about himself. It's exactly the same mindset that I'm seeing at play here. You say you detest women, but that's just a cope. You say that because something at some point happened so that you got rejected. So now you have started to reject yourself, the object of your own desire. But this, on a psychological level, I can tell you, is only going to lead to one thing, and that is your own ruin. It's going to make you miserable. It would be the equivalent of being gay and being closeted, to go back to the gay thing. No gay man that pretended to be straight had a happy life ever. Why? You're denying who you are. It's the same for all of that insult talk. Stop LARPing. You're not a woman hater. You don't have it in you. I don't think that's true. I think that what happened is that you got hurt one day, hurt people hurt people, and you decided, fuck it. If no one wants me, I'm going to make myself as undesirable as ever. And I'm going to pretend that I'm doing that on purpose. I'm the one who doesn't want women in my life. You are lying. But listening to that type of talk is only going to promote your own loneliness by destroying your perception of women, furthering the divide between the genders. And this is why I cannot take people like Andrew Tate seriously. The guy calls himself an anti-feminist, but he's exactly like the feminist. What he's doing is he is following in the grand design of the divide between the sexes. He is trying to separate men and women. He's creating a world where Men are not going to trust women because they're going to be presented as temptresses and evil and they're just after your money and they're going to break your heart. All of that which ultimately means the destruction of the nuclear family. Again, ironical considering that the guy's entire speech is about rejecting modernity. How exactly does that compute? Again, I don't know if he means by that a return to tradition and maybe in his head tradition is the man who takes all of those decisions and the woman who is subservient. I have newsflash for you, your dreamlike trad wife that does whatever you want and just gives you children and takes care of the house does not exist. If you want to get with a girl, you're going to have to make peace with that and you're going to have to make some efforts to try to understand them. Andrew Tate, I can tell you that for a fact, doesn't care about understanding women because he has decided that they're stupid. It reminds me of kids who suck at math and instead of saying, okay, I need to work harder or they just shrug their shoulders and they say, well, math is stupid. It's not my fault. Again, people who look at problems as exterior to them so as to not have to face them head on. This is cowardly. I myself have made videos about women. I myself have defined my ideology as sexist, but I've also told you guys I'm a feminist. So how does that compute? 
Well, it really doesn't because these are just words. What matters again is not the words, it's the consequences. It's the goal. What is the goal? What is the motivation? What can you see beyond the mask? Beyond Andrew Tate's mask, I only see resentment and actual hatred. But if you listen to me, listen to my videos, I put them in the description, when I talk about masculinity, when I talk about women, what do you perceive? What transpires? Love. It's a labor of love. When I talk about women, some people can say that what I say is sexist because I have certain strong ideas, but deep down, all of it stems from curiosity. I'm trying to understand women better because I love them, because I have a life with one. Unlike so many of these guys, and I say so many, all of them, all of your masculinity gurus are celibate. Or if they're not, they're single and they go from girl to girl. They never have kids. They never have families. Is this what you want? Is this why you started? Is this why you want to be more alpha, to be just the guy who fucks random sluts his entire life? Is this a life worth living? The answer is no. It's devoid of anything. It's devoid of spirituality. But since you're listening to someone who is essentially a consumerist trying to get more people to become consumerists to make money, it's not surprising. He sees women as tools, just like he sees you as a tool. He sees everyone as a tool. He is a complete sociopath. Most of these guys are. Their goal is to make money. It was never to actually benefit you or to better your life. And the best proof I have of this, and I'm going to end the video on it, I saw the guy praying in a mosque in Dubai. The dude is trying to pull a return to Jesus moment, except it's a return to Mecca moment where he's now pretending to be Muslim. Now, how does it make sense in your head? The only way to make sense of it is to look at it for the motivation and not for what he tells you. He tells you it's because Islam is based, Islam understands everything, Islam is the best religion, all things that he's trying to say because he knows it's going to attract you if you are Muslim. But in reality, he is just prostituting Islam. He is literally using the religion of Islam to be able to get more followers, to get more clicks, and to get more money. He doesn't care about Allah. He doesn't care about the faith at all. And I'm familiar with that strategy because I've seen French influencers do that. They look at the target demographic. They see a lot of young Muslim men and they say, okay, I have Muslims who follow me. If I become Muslims, I am going to attract more of them. Then there's also the fact that Islam is extremely attractive for young men. Why? Young men who have no sense of purpose, who need a family structure and a sense of belonging, get welcomed in Islam. They get embraced by Islam. So of course they're going to want to join it. Then you have some scum like him who sees that and thinks, okay, I want my part of the cake as well. I want to also LARP as a Muslim. Do you think that Andrew Tate is the type of man who is going to wake up at 4 a.m. to do the first prayer? Do you think he's someone who is going to follow Ramadan? Do you think he's someone who is going to pray five times a day? Who is going to follow the pillars of Islam? Absolutely not. I wouldn't be surprised if the guy was smoking and drinking right now talking. He does not respect anything. He only sees things, again, as I said, as a tool. He looked at Islam and he said, this is a tool. And he, the thing that made me laugh is the fact that this happened in Dubai. And then if this is not the best metaphor of what I just explained to you guys, I don't know what is. Dubai is devoid of any spirituality. It's a bullshit empty city. And the Muslims that live there are shaitan. These people are not Muslims. Calling them Muslim is an insult to Islam as a whole. When you look at the things they do, they consume cocaine, they consume drugs, they engage in prostitution. They represent the exact opposite of what the religion preach. But when someone like Andrew Tate embraces Islam, it promotes that idea. It promotes that idea that Islam is a baseless religion, devoid of spirituality. I wanted to say that because I know I have Muslim followers and I hope you didn't fall for that. This is clearly a strategy by someone who is unconcerned with ethics and will do whatever it takes to gather fame and money even if it means taking one of the greatest religion and trying to just bend it to his will. All of that for the sake, again, of more followers. It is absolutely despicable. And with all I gave to you, I hope that you are now armed. You are armed with the necessary knowledge to protect yourself because you now better understand the type of men we are dealing with here. It is Andrew Tate today. 
a year ago it was Dan Bilzerian, in a year it's going to be Jack, Jack whatever the fuck. They have different shapes, they have different names, but their motivations and their goals are always the same. It's to make themselves more money, make themselves more famous, and whatever is in the way they will destroy. And this is why they are dancing on the grave of masculinity. You know, when I see people who call that guy the resurgence of masculinity, like he's going to save the masculine essence, I love. He saves absolutely jack shit, but his bank account. He disregards the feminine essence, doesn't understand it. You think he's going to understand the masculine essence? Absolutely not. At no point in time is this guy going to bring any solution. If anything, he's just making it worse. This is the end times. This is the end of masculinity. And the fact that guys like him, fake apostles in reality, are making their operations and being followed by so many men is the sign. The average guy is so lost and so blind, knows so little about their own self and their own masculine essence, that they will fall for false prophets times and times again. And it is something that is not limited to just the circle of fitness. We also see that with boxing, with people like Jake Paul. We live in a time where there will always be people willing to prostitute noble arts and noble practices to get themselves more attention, to get themselves more money. And if you are incapable of seeing through that, unfortunately, you're very likely to fall for the scam as well. But I think that with everything I shared in this video, you are better armed to prepare yourself and to actually develop yourself as a man, as opposed to just becoming a little slave that is going to be part of a court that is just going to reduce your reach and re reduce your ability to be happy, to form a family, to connect with a woman one day and to live life the way it was intended to be lived.